My guest today is Jason Bach. Jason, how are you, sir? I'm doing well. How about yourself? I'm doing really well. Tell us, what do you do for a living? So right now I, I am a staff software, engineer, uh, staff software engineer at Rocket Mortgage. That's always a mouthful. I don't know why, but <laughs> um, I've been there now. Software. Yeah. <laughs> I've been there for just over four years. I oh, hit wow. my four year anniversary last week. So I've been there for just over four years. Uh, before that, most of my career was as a consultant um, for almost 25 years. So my my entire career in general has been doing software development in one way or another in different roles. So yeah, almost 30 think, years at this point. I think you're pretty well known for it. I know you speak at a lot of conferences and... Uh... Uh, I'm very familiar with Rocket Mortgage because I, I grew up in the Detroit area where they're based, and that's uh, I know a lot of folks that work there and have worked there. Yeah. Um, we were talking the other day. We were at, we were at VS Live. Uh, oh, it was a month and a half ago, I think. And you were telling me about something that I was completely unfamiliar with—a feature of C Sharp about uh, source generator. I think it's called. Yes, source generators. Yep. Tell me about that. So. To, to back up just a little bit, you know, if we think about code generation in general, that, that's something that people have done in one way or another for decades yeah. in, in various languages, various tools. Uh, essentially, the idea of instead of me having to write out boilerplate code or, or repeated code or things that are generally fairly easy to write or they're just tedious or they're tedium, you know, yeah, but they have to be code. done. Plumbing yeah. Stuff. That type of stuff. Um, rather than having a developer having to redo that over and over again, why don't we run a tool that says, Hey, do this for me, maybe based on some input, maybe I have an XML file or a JSON file and it just spits out all this code on the other side. And then that's code I don't have to write. So, Hopefully it's the, the input is small ish and the generator ends up doing a lot of scaffolding or upfront work that I don't have to do. You sure. Know, there was, I remember using uh, CodeSmith many years ago. A lot. Yep. Great for yeah, that, if I had to generate similar code lots and lots of times, then that little bit of upfront work paid off. Yeah, that that's one tool that people used a lot. Uh, T4 templates I is another one. Well. Yeah. yeah. So, so these, these tools that, you know, they'll have like a templating engine with a particular style or format to that templating you know, code or whatever you want to call that. And then that's the one that is used to, to generate all of your code. And, and again, other programming languages and environments, they have their own take on this as well. So there, there's, there's nothing new under the sun here in terms of the general concept that's, that's been around for quite a while. What source generators does is it allows you to generate this code during compile time. And in fact, it will typically run, especially if you're using a tool like Visual Studio or Rider, it will run whenever you change your code. Hmm. And I'm going to be a little bit hand wavy there because I don't know the inner workings of these IDEs to know exactly when they will call your generator. Like, is it every keystroke? Is it like when you pause a little bit? You know, that's that's an implementation detail a little bit to these IDEs. But essentially, you can think about it when whenever you have a delta in your code, your generator participates in the compilation pipeline. And then you can know right away when somebody's changed something in their code and then react accordingly to it. So these also work at the command line. So if you do .NET build, these analyze, I'm sorry, not analyzers, because analyzers is a part of Roslyn, so are source generators. So all that stuff kind of comes hand in hand. But these generators will run if you're using a, a command line process as well. So uh, that so you don't need to be in an IDE to make these work. They're They're built right into the whole pipeline that Roslyn, which is the code name that was given to the compiler, what now, 10-ish years ago, um, that we all use. Yeah, I remember when Roslyn was, 
a hint of things like <laughs> way back in 2006 and seven. And then it finally got released in 2015. And now we're almost 10 years later. And wow. that's, you know, C sharp is built with C sharp. That's just the way things are. Um, right. So, so yeah, this feature integrates with, with all that stuff and you can use it to build code based on what exists in your C sharp project, or you can use what's called additional files. So again, the, the, the example I gave before, or maybe I have a JSON file that defines a, a set of data. I can have that as an additional file to my project. And then my generator can read that and then build up whatever code it wants based on what's in that JSON file. So uh, first of all, this is just for C sharp. Is that right? Yes, this is a C sharp only feature though. And to, to be honest, I, I haven't even thought of visual basic <laughs> for, for many years. Um, so the, this is definitely not a, a VB feature. This is specific to C sharp. All right. Uh, and then you say that it, uh, it, it kind of listens for changes in your code and then at compile time, it's going to generate code. What, what does it generate? Is it generating more C sharp code? Uh, that yes. you can actually view and edit and debug, or is yeah. it generating IL and binary code that's kind of behind the scenes magic? No, it's it's text. It's C sharp. So that that's another advantage in in my book to source generators, as compared to other tools that do code generation using IL or something like that. And yeah. and that's fine. That's what. Uh, there's still tools out there like Fody, I believe is one that's like an IL weaver hmm. that lets you do all sorts of complicated things to your code, but it's doing it to your binary. And right. at that point you have to kind of know what you're doing with the intermediate language. So that can get a little complicated. That's, that's a fairly heavy lift. This one is easier in that even though you have to understand syntax trees, semantic models, you, you do have to have some decent level of understanding of what these things are. And, and you can find that out. It's not like it's, it's some arcane knowledge. All, all the stuff in Rosalind is documented. So you can find, find these things and, and get a deep understanding of that. But at the end of the day, all you're doing is spitting out strings. You're, you're having strings that contain C sharp code that you basically say at the end, I want to add source to this project. Hmm. And so that source, it's interesting that you mentioned. So is this included with my project? Is this part of what my project does? Can I debug into it? All that is true. Um, one thing to keep in mind is by default, if you include a package that has a source generator in it, what, what will happen is, the code gets generated, but it's not by default generated in a spot that's in your project. So you typically don't see it um, from that perspective. And I think it's done that way for at least one reason that maybe you don't want your generated source code to clutter up your Git repository or something like that. Mm -hmm. So you could include that. You could, There is a way to then say in your project file, I want the generated code to be saved in a particular directory because you do want to see it or you want to be able to look at it um, on disk re relatively easily. So that well, is, where, it is where an is option. it saved by default? I honestly don't know. It's, it's right. some local folder that's relative to who you are as your user, I believe. Oh, well, then, I looked at, well, I looked at somebody else ones. looks at that your code tries to get it out of the source code repository, then that generated code will not be there. Is that what I'm hearing? Correct, but if they're going to load it, the project, or they're going to build it on their machine, it will just be generated. It'll generate again for them. Oh, I see. Interesting. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Um, to, uh, talk me th what, through the developer experience. How do I turn on this feature, and how do I use it as a developer? So as a developer, um, it, l let me I'll, – I'll get to that question, but I, okay. I just want to finish the thought about I the, didn't mean to interrupt. The, I'm sorry. <laughs> the The – the code being generated on disk, um, wh whether you explicitly say I want it in this folder or you just say let the tool handle where the code is and making sure it all gets compiled together, it all gets compiled together. So your generated code is in your assembly. And furthermore, if you want to debug, if you really want to do that or you want to F12 into 
your generated code, you can do that and you can see what a code generator does, which is really nice. It's, yeah. you know, it may not make the most sense or maybe it's not in the same style that you write, but you can see it and you can mm -hmm. debug it. If you think there is an issue with the code generator, you can step into it just like you would any other C-sharp code. So that's actually nice, both, uh, both as an author of a source generator, but also as somebody who's consuming them. So to dovetail that into your question of if, if what's the experience like as a developer, um, there, there's, to me, there's like two views of that experience. One, if I am authoring them as a developer or one of the, what one view is if I'm consuming them. So let's go through both of those. Mm -hmm. Um, the, the consuming side is actually easy. You typically have these all packaged up as NuGet packages. Hmm. So, for example, I have a source generator out there called Rocks, and you can find that in NuGet. The repository is out there in GitHub. That one is a mocking tool. So, if you use something like MLQ and Substitute, those types of uh, frameworks or packages, those allow you to create mocks in your tests. What Rocks does is essentially the same thing, except it's all using a source generator. Hmm. So if you wanted to use it, you would just reference the package like you normally would any other NuGet package, and then it just lights up and it works. You, you basically have to put attributes in your code to say what types do I want to mock, but that's it. And then it will the documentation tell, you know, will explain how the mocking infrastructure is set up and what you can then call and what you can do. Yeah, but again, from a consuming side, it's it's pretty easy. Hmm, okay. The authoring side is a little bit more of a heavy lift. It's a, it's a little bit harder to do. Um, and the reason why is this. To, to author a source generator, in some ways, it's pretty simple. There's one interface you have to implement. I think it's I incremental generator. And there's one method that you have to implement. So that sounds pretty easy. Right. But it starts getting complicated because again, you are working with the compiler pipeline. You do have to understand to some appreciable degree, concepts like syntax trees, like semantic models, how these work, what are you looking for? So there, there has to be some knowledge that you have to, to gain to go, well, I wanna do this. So how do I map my idea into what a source tree would give me that, that currently exists in the project. So that's one thing you have to do. Then you also have to start thinking about, well, once I figure out how I want to pull the data from the compiler and what it currently has essentially in memory for the current compilation, how do I then take that information and turn it into source code? So I said, you're just creating, you're just creating uh, strings, which Sounds simple, but you have to create these essentially strings that have C sharp code within them. Sometimes that's a it's a mind bender when I'm mm -hmm. creating them because I'm writing C sharp code to Generate create C sharp, C -sharp code yeah. in a string, and it, it, sometimes I have to keep in mind the context of what I'm actually doing. It can get a little confusing. Mm -hmm. um, I, I typically use raw string literals, which was a wonderful addition to C sharp. I think it was ten where you can basically have multi-line strings now in C sharp. Okay. And as a code generator author, that has been a godsend because you can have code that look, you know, it starts looking more like C sharp yeah. and then you can use them as interpolated strings and fill in holes and stuff like that. Right. So you could even indent it like uh, your yep. source code and your repository. Is. Yeah. So that, that just takes some time to get that down so that you are, looking for the right data and that you're also generating the right code. There's a couple of helper libraries from Microsoft to help with testing, mm -hmm. to test your source generators and make sure that, hey, I, I have this input as C-sharp code in a string. I'm expecting this output as a C-sharp C-sharp code in a string. Mm -hmm. Is this correct or does it not match? So that's helpful as well. Yeah. But that still takes a little bit of time to to do. So that's, I think one of the uh, interesting aspects of source generators is there's 
just just the point of getting it to actually generate the correct code that you wanted to. The other one is is publishing and packaging. Like I said, you're typically going to have these as NuGet packages, either if it's internal and you have like some internal NuGet server somewhere that you publish these to, or you publish them to the outside world, uh, NuGet.org. Either way, when you typically say, I want to create a NuGet package from a class library, these days it's really easy. You basically just have a couple settings in your CS proj file to say, create me a NuGet package, and it does. Hmm. And then you just have to publish it. It's it's pretty simple. For a package that has a source generator in it, it's essentially the same thing, but long and short of it is that there's lots of weird little idiosyncrasies that you have to be aware of. For example, if you are referencing another package that you need to be there when your generator is running, not when their code when their code has now been compiled and they have an assembly that has your your generated code in it. Okay. That's another situation you have to keep in mind too. But if you just need it for something you're doing in your source generator, there's special things you have to do to make sure that that package gets deployed correctly and in, 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 and put, put in your package and handle correctly by things like the IDE, but then its dependencies also need that same special treatment. So when I mentioned these cookbook documents and, and I don't have the URLs offhand, but if you look up like C sharp source generator cookbook, yeah, um, I have it there's open like, right now. yeah, there's like two documents that they have out there that one of them describes this scenario and starts to show just how fun <laughs> that can be. So, there's uh, a lot of things I've learned by writing source generators and and lessons that I've learned about doing that. And that's one of them is minimize the dependencies that your generator needs. Mm, okay. Now, the code that you generate may need a dependency. That's a slightly different and easier scenario to handle. But if your generator needs a dependency, try to minimize that as much as you can because that can get rather complicated in a hurry. So, mm -hmm. so if you want to go down the path of writing a source generator, those are a couple things to consider. And the big one too, I think out of anything else is you have to keep in mind that your generator is running along with the compiler. You're plugged into the compiler and the compiler team at Microsoft is very, very sensitive to performance. <laughs> they want to make sure ask that- you about that. What's his air performance hit? Yeah, well, there can be. It it depends on what your generator does. So one of the things with source generators is when it was first released, there was an interface called iSource Generator. And you'll still find references to that even three years later. That's one that you shouldn't use anymore because it, <clears throat> it didn't essentially plug into the pipeline as well as it could. When you use iIncremental Generator, if you do it right, and again, there's lots of details in this, but essentially if you handle your source generation correctly, such that you can create an immutable data structure that's, that has equality there. So if you create a record, that helps because records do equality for you out of the box. But if you do this correctly, what can happen is the next time somebody changes their code, if the compiler tells your generator, hey, something's changed, take a look at it. And what you produce is a model that's exactly the same thing as before. It won't go through the step of now telling you, now generate your code. So there's a not, there's a, like a caching optimization that can happen there. So, but you have to keep that in mind and you have to design your source generator to take advantage of that. Hmm. If you don't, then the source generator is going to constantly not only call you like it should, but then also keep telling you to generate source code where you may just be doing a duplication of that generation over and over and over again. And yeah. that's not good. Right. So you have to keep that in mind and you also have to try to generate your code as fast as you can, you know, which everybody wants to write fast code. You know, that's, <laughs> I think everybody has always got that intention, but especially in this arena, you really want to make sure that 
you're, you're trying to get that done as quick as you can, because you don't want to set, you don't want to be calling any REST services or doing any network calls or anything mm. like that in your generator, because relative to what a compiler does, that's going to be a big hit. Sure. So and it might you fail. really, well, and that too. Yeah. So you, you really want to avoid doing those types of things. Can you give me an example of uh, when you've used this tool to generate something? Well, the, the one that I gave, um, uh, uh, the one about the mocking framework rocks, that's, that's one that I've created myself. There's other generators I've created because I, I really like fell off the edge when <laughs> I heard about this feature and when it finally came out. I, I've always been interested in compilers and metaprogramming and those types of things. So when I heard that you can do source generation, which to be clear, does not edit any code that exists. It only is additive. So it only mm -hmm. allows you to add code to a project. But even that is powerful. And so I created a whole bunch of projects to play with it and see what I could do with it. The one that I spend the most time on is this one called Rocks okay. to generate mocking infrastructure at compile time. So at that's one example. Repo right now on GitHub. Okay. So that's one of my personal ones. There's lots of things that people have done in the .NET community to build source generators for a whole bunch of things. One that comes to mind is people have written source generators for dependency injection. Hmm. Um, and what that gives you a potential advantage of is knowing that you, you screwed up something with your IOC registrations at compile time and not at runtime. Hmm. So you get that feedback right away that you either got everything set up or there might be a problem and then you have to go in and fix it, but you know right away. Okay, fail fast, yeah. Yeah, and then as we were talking before we started this, I, I mentioned there's a couple of them that are in the box now in .NET, which hmm. is kind of nice to see that there's not only a feature that people use, but that .NET teams are actually using this feature to make things even better in .NET. So one of them that's come out in recent history is allowing you to do regular expressions with source generators. So mm -hmm. the the traditional approaches still work. So it's not like you have to change all your code if you've done stuff with regular expressions before. But there's now an option where you basically create a partial method, attribute it with, I think it's called like generated reg regex, and you put your regex string in there and then the source generator just goes to town and creates all of the code necessary to mm -hmm. implement that regular expression. So there's a lot of advantages to this. One, it's faster. Typically, typically it's faster. I mean, that's a general hand wave, but typically it's faster than things that happen in runtime. It can be, it, it's AOT friendly. So when I mean AOT, I mean of ahead of time compilation. Mm -hmm. If it detects that the stuff with the generated source code for that regular expression isn't used, it can essentially trim it out and it's not going to be part of the trimmed assembly. So there's some perf benefits there as well. Hmm. Um, it also is code that you can again read. So all, anything a source generator does, you as a consumer of it can read it. And one of the things I noticed that the team that created the source generator did that's really nice and I actually want to steal a couple of ideas for my stuff is they, they did a really good job documenting that generated code. And so what happens is when you create a regular expression and you hover over that attribute, it will light up um, the, 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 the help that like Visual Studio gives you. And it gives you a really nice description of what it thinks this regular expression is going to do like what you typed in. It's like, that I think helpful. this is what you meant. It's going to regex do. is hard. It's just, a yeah, <laughs> it's a, it's a whole language into its it, in and of itself. And this helps reduce that barrier of entry to kind of go, well, this is what I typed in, or this is what I stole from some website. If I want to parse a GUID or I want to parse a phone number, you know, the regular expression generated source code will have, a detailed XML help description to say, th these are the things I think you wanted to do with like capture groups and all that other stuff. So that's really nice. And if you really want to see how 
that regular expression is implemented, you can take a look at the source code. It's it's not simple. There's lots of little tricks that they're doing to make it as fast as they possibly can. So when you run your regex, it runs fast. So you'll see things like potentially go to statements in there because for for little performance case reasons, that's actually going to make things slightly faster. So you can take a look at this implementation and maybe learn a thing or three about how to make your code a little faster too when you write it. So, Very cool. so yeah, there, there's lots of places where where source generators either exist in the box for .NET or the community has created things in various areas of development to help you out. Awesome. We are almost at time. Where is a good place for people to go to learn more? So a couple of them that I already mentioned, the, the links that the, the links to those cookbooks mm -hmm. are highly recommended. I they're they're very shows. helpful. Uh, there's a Discord channel out there. I can get you the link, David, to that. Um, that is, you'll see a lot of people from Microsoft in that channel. So I put that in the chat here, and then you can just, you know, put that into the video. That's one that I would also recommend getting into and asking questions. Again, keep in mind, these are people on the compiler team, so that they'll definitely help you out, but they also have a lot of knowledge in this. So you may have to up your game a little bit just to make sure you understand the concepts that are in Roslyn. But the, not only them, but other people in the community are very helpful. So that's another good reference. And then take a look at how a source generator is implemented. You know, the like the regular expression one, .NET's open source. So if you really wanted to, you could go to the .NET repository and drill into and find out how do they actually generate, how, how do they actually generate the, the code mm -hmm. that implements a regular expression? You could go to my rocks repository and look at, well, how did I get this all tied together or mm -hmm. look at somebody else's? So right. you can also just read code that's been done and get, get a better understanding as to how do you start and where do you go to, to make these things happen. Awesome. Um, I It is awesome because I knew nothing about this 30 okay. minutes ago, and now I feel like I've increased my knowledge exponentially, and I appreciate that. Thank you so much, Jason. Mm -hmm. No problem. Remember, friends and technology go hand in hand.